All right, well, I think we'll get started with our webinar today. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Today's webinar will feature Cindy Toll of Evergreen Ranching and Anna Jones Crabtree and Doug Crabtree of Velikas Farms. We will focus on how these farmers are working to build water resilience in their organic regenerative operations. During the presentation, we will have lots of time for Q&A, so please submit any questions via the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. They will answer the questions throughout the presentation, or we will make sure to address them at the end. If you have any questions that you would like to direct at someone in particular, please add their name in, and then Nicole will gather the questions and make sure to ask the farmer that you would like to hear from. Also, please note that this webinar is being recorded and will be posted to our website in the following days. Before we begin the fun part of today's presentation, we do have a few quick investor relation updates that we would like to share with you all. Um, first, I would like to introduce Nicole, our new investor relations coordinator. Nicole joined us in December and has played a crucial role in helping us respond to investor inquiries and process new investments. Nicole is based in Southern Oregon and she is incredibly knowledgeable about organic and regenerative agriculture. She's been a fantastic addition to the team and we're so happy to have her here. We also are continuing to expand the team and we're currently searching for an investor relations analyst to join us. This role will support the team by researching prospects and preparing marketing materials among many other tasks. More information can be found on our website on the careers page. We'll make sure to drop a link in the chat as well. Um, we would love it if you could share it with anyone that you think could be a good fit. We are also excited to announce a new investor portal that will be released in early May. We have been diligently working to provide investors with an enhanced portal experience while also coordinating with the FTI consulting team to ease some of our investor administration. Chris, our CEO, likes to call this moving from spreadsheets to systems, and we are thrilled to be able to automate some of our processes to better serve our investors. All this to say, stay tuned for some upcoming announcements on when we'll be switching the portal. Our emails will also have a new look too, so be on guard for that. Um, Nicole and I will be reaching out to schedule training sessions, hosting a webinar, and offer lots of support during the time so we can make the transition as smooth and as seamless as possible. And finally, the last announcement, our REIT equity shares offering will be paused beginning April 15th for our share price valuation. We expect to begin accepting new investments again in early May. If you are interested in investing at the current share price of $107 per share, please note that all documents and funds must be received by April 15th. Now, I'm excited to soon hand it over to Cindy, Anna, and Doug for their discussion on building water resilience. I'll briefly introduce them, and then they can discuss their operation and background in more detail while also setting the stage for our Q&A. Cindy began Evergreen Ranching and Livestock at LLC in 2015, once her Criollo herd of cattle reached recovery numbers in the US. Over the past nine years, Evergreen Ranching has grown to be one of the largest grass-fed, grass-finished beef companies in the region, with customers in healthcare, education, restaurants, and retail. Cindy has hubs in Arizona, Missouri, and South Dakota. In addition to bison and Criollo recovery, Cindy is a trained biologist and environmental chemist. Grassland restoration and ecosystem health is Cindy's passion, and using the right animal for the landscape is her area of research. Producing high quality meat products while protecting and restoring large landscapes is Evergreen's major focus. And now, Anna and her husband, Doug, own and manage Felicus Farms, a first generation organic 12,500 acre dryland crop farm in Northern Hill County, Montana growing a diverse array of organic heirloom and specialty grain, pulse, oilseed, and broadleaf crops under five and seven year rotations. Over 26% of their land is in non-crop conservation and 300 acres seeded to native pollinator habitat. Annually, they seed over 3,000 acres of cover crops and use integrated grazing. They also host an organic farm apprenticeship program to mentor beginning farmers through the challenges of starting a large scale dryland organic farming operation. We are so grateful for Cindy, Anna, and Doug's time today, and are really excited to hop into their presentations. So without further ado, we'll start with you, Cindy. Um, can you please okay. share more about your operation and how you're building water resilience? Sure. Let me uh, go ahead and share my 
screen here. Okay, so I I want to just make this as casual as possible so we can, you know, if you guys have questions, um, definitely lay them on. Um, that was a great introduction. Thank you. Uh, I'm Cindy Toll. I'm right now in South Dakota. Um, I do own Evergreen Ranching, which we're totally vertically integrated. So we have ranches uh, throughout the West. We have our own meat processing facility in Sturgis, South Dakota. And then we also have our own food distribution system. So we basically go farm to fork and uh, we go into a variety of different uh, sectors for food. And I'll talk more about that. Okay, how do we advance this? Ehole. Okay, so so one of the reasons that I I'm so passionate about about what I do is because uh, people are sick in the United States, as we know, and um, you know one of the things that is causing this obviously is processed foods, and we all know that. And that's kind of probably why we're all here in the same room. And one of the things I can do for my part is um, by helping to provide a really good, you know, meat source. We not only do bison and beef, but we also do pasture pork, lamb, and goat. And then we coordinate with other producers that do uh, pasture chickens and turkeys and, and other critters, quail at times, actually, too. Um, to, to us, it's really important that everything we do is, is healthful, environmentally sustainable. Uh, we have very successful regional products. We have a, a jerky line that's totally clean. It's all over the West. Um, we do beef tallow. We have uh, lotions and soaps and candles. And, and then obviously we've got meat. And then uh, we just launched recently a new line of pet food products, which has been really fun. So we go nose to tail. All of our hides currently go to um, a, a tannery in Wisconsin, and they they are, are used to make Uggs, which is pretty cool. So as was mentioned in the introduction, we do have um, some hubs. We have a big hub in, in southeastern Arizona, which um, Iroquois Valley has invested in one ranch, and we're in the process of another larger ranch. Uh, that's a that's a really neat property that's right in a biodiverse, probably the most biodiverse corridor in North America, actually. It's right in a conservation zone, which is why we invested there. And I'll talk more about that in a second. Um, we have a, a farm in Missouri. And the reason we farm in Missouri is because we're really close to our, we have a bunch of business in Kansas City, Springfield, St. Louis. And now we're stretching down into Arkansas from that hub. Um, we have evergreen ranching and livestock in South Dakota, which is where we finish most of our cattle. And then the packing plant is also in South Dakota. So our finished cattle uh, go into that packing plant. They come to South Dakota from Arizona and Missouri. And then we also have a family ranch down in the mountains of, of Mexico. And that's, uh, we have a breeding herd of Criollo cattle, which we brought from ex near extinction starting in 1998. And that's right in the um, Tutuaca protected area of flora and fauna. So it's we're right in the heart of a national park there. It's really a beautiful spot. So the ranch I'm going to talk about briefly here is our ranch in Arizona because it's, it's the one that's actually um, probably our best water project. Uh, Arizona obviously has less rain than most other places. And so this, this investment that we made in this ranch, we did it in part because um, one of the things I'm really good at is, is water harvesting. I can take a, a, a landscape that's been totally wrecked and I can go on the land and, and restore it in a sense that um, the, the land actually, you know, goes from, nothing, no grass at all to avid grasslands in not not much time. In Arizona, we can do that in two seasons. We can get grass growing 
after water harvesting and water capturing. And we do that by a variety of different techniques. But that's one of the, the restoration piece is one of the reasons I invested in this property because we have huge restoration potential. And we're in negotiations right now with Arizona Game and Fish on a $2 million restoration project where they're going to pump $2 million into this project for us to bring water back to the land, which is pretty neat. Um, the other thing that's really, really interesting about Arizona is the property that we invested in there is surrounded by protected lands and federal land. So it's really prime for conservation easements. And we've taken that entire ranch and we've got, right now we've got phase one of an easement that's in process for 1500 acres. We've got phase two in process for another 8,100 acres. And then we'll do a phase three to cover the entire ranch. So at some point in the near future, probably within three years, we'll have the entire property, which is about 14,000 deeded acres and another, you know, 15, 16,000 in federal lands protected with a conservation easement. So we've got quite a bit of land there. So the the new ranch is 12,000 acres and, and the old ranch is, is uh, that we bought a couple years ago is just a little over a thousand. So it borders all kinds of protected lands. So Arizona, again, here is why we invested. Biodiversity. Um, the land is right in the central flyway for grassland birds. I'm passionate. I'm an ecologist. I'm passionate about, you know, restoring lands and habitat. And so the, the property in Arizona is desert grassland that's now infested with shrubs and by the time we're done with it we're going to have all the shrubs or most of the shrubs controlled and we'll increase the grasslands and hopefully we can restore the grassland bird population which is declining throughout the country by 70 percent so we're basically doing our part to make sure that grassland birds have a place to live during and in the central flyway as they migrate from north to south um, again, it's a challenging project in the sense that it's dry and the water harvesting part and the regenerative grazing that we do, um, will bring water back to the land. And then again, we have great conservation partners. So we're doing our part to protect a huge wildlife corridor right down the spine of New Mexico, Arizona, Sonora, and Chihuahua. Ranching, as um, you guys probably know, is is not an easy job. I mean, it's a lifestyle. It's not a, um, it's it's a lot of work, but uh, but it's really rewarding. I mean, my kids, I've all raised my kids on the ranches since you know they were itty bitty, since they were born. Actually, they were born on the ranch, and uh, and we do all kinds of neat things. Like they get involved in. Uh, in native fish inventories and and in Mexico they were involved in a thick billed parrot project, which is a endangered parrot. And then also the restoration of the bison herd down in Mexico, which which we did in 1999. And that brought a uh, we restored a the bison to northern Mexico where they were native. So it's it's a it's a lifestyle. It's a good choice. So here's some uh, some just kind of random pictures of the landscapes that we work in and my kids and Stephen Terrell, who's my partner down in Arizona is in the red shirt. But anyway, in a nutshell, that's kind of what we do. Uh, water harvesting, uh, regenerative grazing. And for us, it's basically what that means is, is taking our big ranch and splitting it up into smaller pastures and allowing our animals to rotate through those pastures so that they can impact the the land with urine and feces and, and graze it to a, a certain level and just make it more nutrient rich as they move on to the next paddock. And then we rest it and then it restores itself. And so that's really the, the wave of the future. And, and uh, by allowing our animals to restore the land for us, and taking those same animals and putting them into the food supply system, that's kind of our 
you know, that's our model and that's our passion and that's what we do. So I'm going to stop there and open it up if anybody has any questions. That was kind of a, just an overview. Yeah. I think we'll, what we'll do is we will uh, move on to Anna and Doug, and then we'll do questions at the end, if that works for you, Cindy. Yeah, that's fine. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you so much for that overview. Yeah, that was just, a, yeah, just an overview. I'll be happy to address anything in more detail. Beautiful. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing. Thanks, Cindy. Anna, you're on mute. Technology. Oh, there yes. you are. I can hear you. <laughs> Try that. I don't. <laughs> I don't know what happened. Uh, anyway, can you guys see us and hear us? Okay. Yes, it's perfect. Right. I think Donna might have had her hand up real quick, but. I'm nope. all set. Thank you, Anna. Okay. All right. Well, hi, everyone. Thanks for uh, inviting us to talk. I'm Anna Jones-Crabtree. And I'm Doug. Um, Cindy, thank you for sharing. That, that's a tough act to follow. I... Oh, <laughs> no, I'm, you, I'm sure what you guys do is way harder. You're farmers. <laughs> <laughs> I I always really appreciate uh, sharing a platform with, with other organic growers because you know we're always sort of on islands and uh, when we look across the road or the fence and compare ourselves to to what most of our neighbors do it seems like we have an awful lot going on and then to hear someone uh, you know the, the bit of the story that you shared is just a wake-up call that uh, there are more of us out here that are embracing diversity and uh, and complexity and uh and there are good reasons for it. So, so thanks again. Yeah. So, Cindy, we should track. We should track the birds because they probably fly over your place in Arizona and then fly over right. our, place. Right. <laughs> our place in Montana. Yeah, so, we're on the same flyways, I think. Well, we have uh, quite a few slides. It's going to be a whirlwind tour of our farm and some of the craziness we have going on in the learning. Um, so we started our farm from scratch in 2009. So we kind of considered a big wild uh, experiment. Mm -hmm. Um, we're located, let's see, there we go. We're located here right on the border of Canada, Alberta and Saskatchewan. We, we actually farm, uh, land that, that has the provincial border immediately north of it. So easy to find on a map that way. It's just a barbed wire fence. So, <laughs> um, our, our county, Hill County has a population of roughly 16,000 and we're 40 miles to the nearest town, Haver, that's just under 10,000. It's 150 miles to the nearest airport in this country. Um, hundred miles up to Medicine Hat. Our Annual average rainfall here is just over 11 inches. Uh, we haven't seen that in the last three. Um, and uh, when we first moved here, I like to share this quote. Uh, one of the neighbors that had been here his whole life told me that um, they farm where it's too dry to raise cattle. And I really didn't understand that for several years, but, but I, I understand a lot better now. Although today we're sitting here basking in the uh, about, about an inch of rain that we got overnight, which was uh, such a gift. So for us, it's really about the timing of the rain and being um, ready to to make sure you're able to take advantage of the moisture when you come, um, when you're ready to go. So a little bit about our operation. Uh, we're 12,500 acres. Uh, we're really only cropping not all of that by any stretch every year. We have a lot of uh, conservation buffers and field borders. Um, we've done over 300 acres of pollinator habitat. We're the largest bee butter certified farm on the planet. 
<laughs> I like to say. Um, we'll go a little bit into our crop rotations. Uh, we've got some integrated grazing, which is upping our game around water retention and soil building. Um, and we're in process to regenerative organic certification. This is just a, a quick map, the layout of the farm. We have four individual units within a, uh, roughly 20 miles in, in both directions, the total footprint. Um, you can see the lavender, yellow, green, and orange are lands we manage. The pink are federal lands, just for some pr perspective. Uh, the little gray boxes are state held land and the white are other private owners. So we, um, we're, we're fairly spread out for a farm, but uh, um, that gives us, we believe, a little more uh, resilience in itself. And it's been very fascinating over the last few years to really watch the differences in moisture and even the weather that happens on from north to south. So that has impacted some of our timing around field operations and where we move and where we go. A lot of the lands in the north are in uh, duck nesting habitat. And so often we can't even get up there till later in the season. Um, but being on the prairie is kind of a really fun place to be and a unique place. There's less than five people per square mile in the place that we farm. And we are in some of the last uh, intact temperate grasslands that also exist um, on the planet. So we feel it's really important to think about what it takes to make a prairie. And it's it's much more than uh, just the clovers and the bees. Sometimes you need a little reverie from some people. So, so we've worked a lot at building some community around the farm and people engagement. Um, this is just a, it takes a lot of reverie, but it also takes moisture to make it happen. This is a few years ago, Alben came from France. He's in the left, uh, grew up on a farm and was wanting to convert that farm when he took it over to organic. So he came to work with us for, a couple of years and he and Langley, our farm camper, were out doing soil testing a few years ago. The important thing to remember though is water resilience. It's not just one thing. It's, it's not a checklist. It's really looking at the system of uh, what is your farm system? What's the system of ecology around you? Um, and you really need to think about how you stack functions and work together. So this was the previous herd of Jack Russell Terriers actually working together. <laughs> Uh, if you look at our farm, uh, we look really different from the sky. So we've worked hard to work with nature. Now, nature doesn't necessarily do things in straight lines, but nature nature believes in biodiversity and not uh, monocropping. And so we're trying to mirror some of that across the landscape. So oops. Uh -oh. Doug's trying to move. <laughs> so there it is from from high above here's oh, here's a field when you look a little closer here's what it looks like when you get down on the on the ground yeah we we intentionally set up this uh, structure in our fields where we farm in strips and then leave what we call conservation strips in between every strip of of cropping and it's just a our imperfect way of, of trying to closely mimic nature and invite her into the landscape of a, of a crop farm. So we started this thinking, okay, uh, we have lighter soils, we want to buffer ourselves from soil erosion, um, but then we quickly said, wow, now we can have native habitat. Oh, wow, we have critters here. These are wildlife corridors. Um, this is from a, a farm tour we had, guys, several years ago and we looked at the habitat we planted in 2018 and some of these field buffers actually have native species coming back in them that were not in the field mix. So our relationships with Xerces have been really important in what we've done and I, I just love this slide. So this field buffer does no longer looks like this. It was one of the first ones we did but when you think about stacking benefits, how can you do one thing that has multiple um, ripple effects. So you put in these field buffers. Oh, guess what? It's wind reduction. It's corridors for wildlife. It's beneficial insect habitat. Um, buffers us from the neighbors that are using substances that we don't want. 
Um, so it's, and then by the way, there's actually pollinators. So in this slide, it's so funny. They took the picture and there actually is a pollinator up here. I don't know if you can see that. <laughs> so, 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 oh yeah, great things, right? Um, they look wonderful in the spring and summer, but guess what? They also are super cool in the winter for us. So this is a picture of a strip in the winter. It's hard to tell, but there's actually a lot more snow catch there. Um, and you can see this when the when it melts. So here it is in the spring. Those winds across the prairie, uh, those field buffers actually leave snow. And we can see this literally in our combine yield monitors next to each of the buffers. Um, but we also have, have just converted 3,000 acres to organic that was Kimfalo no-till. And in some of those fields were really historic hedgerows. And we said, wow, even uh, in 2022, when we had 9% of our average production due to terrible drought, we realized greater, greater yields in these fields with the hedgerows that were not even organic yet. And we're like, well, why is that? Is it the biodiversity? Is it the fact that there's reduced wind, which means there's reduced erosion, re reduced um, um, water, reduced, um, what's the word? When evapor evaporation. evaporation. Yeah, thanks, Doug. <laughs> so we are we're now embarking on some more wild and hairy experiments with hedgerows and eco buffers, also in partnership with uh, Xerces Society. These are the hedgerows behind the house um, just last year. So you can see how much snow gets caught that would normally just blow across a field without anything standing on it. A little bit closer, we took one of the fields that we were converting from organic um, into. into organic and decided to plant one of these hedgerows, uh, extend the hedgerow that was there. So we did a half mile. We're like, oh, a half mile. How hard can that be? Well, <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, big learning lesson. Uh, here we are doing a little bit of inventory um, monitoring prior to the planting of the hedgerow. Xerces uh, did some bug counts, um, what some of the plants were, and then we're going to monitor this over the time frame. Uh, we also have some really interesting equipment we're going to put up this year that can literally it's infrared, so it can tell what bugs fly across when. So we're anxious to get some more inventory there. Here's some pictures of us planting the that half mile hedgerow. And what we did with this is we put up some snow fence, thinking that that would create this nice feedback loop because the snow fence would catch snow. The taller non-native uh, caragana plants would then also catch snow and that would help this one line of native plants actually do better because establishing native natives is challenging. Yeah, so um, this was the, we also had the Montana Conservation Corps come help us and Mad Agriculture did some funding here. Did you want to say something else? Oh, I was looking for the picture of the snow. <laughs> oh, no, it's coming up here and here. Uh, oh, where'd it go? There we go. There big, big reveal. There's the snow from, uh, I, I don't know, that was before our last storm. So this was probably back in uh, February still. So pretty, pretty wonderful to see. So I had to put my friend Susie in here. She's uh, reaching over the Canada um, line, the fence between the Canada and U.S. Susie's a climate scientist and she came and helped us do some of the planting here. Um, so that was fun. The other project we have going on around water retention is in the same field we did the hedgerow. Uh, we had some funding from Lohr Foundation to also put up a snow fence around these cattle dugout areas. So uh, we have to haul water for our cows um, in places that we don't have these dugouts that capture snow water. So we're trying to see if the snow fences actually help us capture more water. Um, so that's that's some of the structural things we're doing, but then there's also a lot embedded with our crop rotation. So Doug, I'll turn that to you here. Yeah, we'll try to give a quick overview of what the cropping system looks like. Um, well, that didn't work. How do I get the actual words? I don't know. I think... um, take my word for it. There's a seven-year crop rotation that is explained on this slide on my screen. And... Uh, then we're going to show some pictures. Let of... me just try one real quick. I'm really sorry, guys. I didn't think it would. 
two seconds, Doug. I want to make this work better for you. Anna is both the uh, the chief conservationist and also the technology expert around here. <laughs> Why? When it works, she has done her job and, and done it well. And when it doesn't, it probably means I have screwed something no, up. No, probably not. Oh, come on. I apologize. I thought we had this all. Yeah, somehow so. the uh, the animation threw it off, I think. Yeah, you always are making it trickier. Why can't I get to the play? Oh. Um, I couldn't get down to my, here we go. View, where's the slide? Slideshow, sorry. All right, there you go. Yay, perfect. There, Doug, now you should be able to go, I think. You're set up. All right. Seven years, sorry. <laughs> so anyhow, a, a diverse, complex rotation. Uh, in our area, the general cropping plan is wheat and fallow or as I like to say, wheat and nothing. And uh, we we attempt to grow um, 20 plus crops every year in a, in a seven year rotation. What do I... Sure. I think if we could just get that whole thing to pull just up. Just have to do it. Worry about All right. the animation. There you go. It's right here. Thanks. I think we will. Nope, no, that's, that's it. it. Okay, that's seven. So we have in that rotation two years that are grain crops. That's the, the most common um, crop that grown around here. And instead of wheat, which is almost everything that surrounds us, we grow uh, six or eight different grains any given year. In between those, we have uh, pulse crops and, and green fallow. And uh, increasingly, we are using those years as a time to integrate grazing. And rather than, than tilling our green manures into the soil, we're letting the animals uh, process them for us. Um, and then at the back end of the rotation, we, we uh, have a place for broadleaf crops, things like uh, flax, mustard, uh, buckwheat, and they're sort of scavenger crops, if you will, at, at that point and just help us add more diversity and put more space between crops, which makes the whole system a bit more resilient. Uh, and here's some pictures. That's a field of rye. And Anna is actually a very tall woman. Uh, so <laughs> in a good year, we can get rye up to six or seven feet tall. Um, this is an interesting crop. It's chickling vetch, which is a very a drought adapted pulse. It's our primary green manure crop. Um, there's a slide of uh, a blade plow terminated a sweet clover green manure, uh, the more typical uh, red, red wheat, spring or winter. And here's something that we're really loving to see more and more of is a, a, a healthy green manure crop being managed with, with animals. And this is a little older slide. That's one of our conservation strips that uh, allow us access to, to crops on either side. There's our oats growing to the left and a, a wheat strip on the, on the right-hand side. There's a field of flax uh, getting ready to bloom and a field of uh, probably yellow field peas, the uh, sweet grass hills in the background. And uh, oh, Rusty's, Rusty's mashed. <laughs> He's in lentils. <laughs> Rusty in the lentils. There's a this one's interesting because we're doing more and more of this intercropping. So this is a field of kamut that we underseeded with flax. And um, if if you get those combinations right, you're able to to get just as much or more of of one crop and have have another as a bonus. And uh, they kind of take up the space where otherwise weeds might grow. Uh, this so is a picture of safflower prior to bloom. Uh, and then within the rotation, we have a perennial phase, which every third cycle, we, we cycle into a period of perennial with alfalfa, sanfoin, and other mixed grasses and let the soil sort of restore itself for three to four years and then restart. 
So it's it's all about building soil and um, thinking about your farming system as well and what's it's adding. What is it adding as much as it's taking out in terms of harvest? Um, cattle integration, a big piece. We've talked about that. My Xerxes friends taught me that dung beetles can fly from 30 miles away. They have a whole series on soil and vertebrate health, really fascinating. We didn't have dung beetles, hadn't had uh, cattle on the landscape for a very long time. And then suddenly here's the dung beetles. It was super fun. We do use uh, mechanical uh, treatment of our soils. Uh, for both weed control and also uh, just for aeration and to incorporate residues. So I, I believe that tillage is the art of farming and something that is, you need to be very mindful about, but uh, the only alternative to tillage is poison and poison is always bad, whereas tillage if properly managed can be beneficial. It's about thinking about disturbance and where is disturbance helpful in your ecosystem or not? So it, and it's all about timing for us. So how do you keep a long view? Um, this is dug after an all night seeding frenzy last year, and we just have to get seed in the ground when it rains. And the timing has become more and more variable due to climate change, which has been fascinating to be on the planet at this point in time. Um, but it also takes a lot of food. So we have a lot of fun dinners. So if you ever find yourself in our area, stop by, we'll make sure we feed you. And then um, use the information about what's going on around you. So there's some really um, great information across the whole country about the drought monitor. So if you're really interested in what's happening in your place, take a chance to look at those maps. Um, we're up here in yellow. We're still in yellow. I'll be anxious to see what happens after this rain that we just got. Um, but the state of Montana um, put together a drought um, strategy a plan and we were really honored to be one of the little case studies included in that plan and so we were lucky to get organic farming actually as a potential solution around climate and uh, drought resilience. So with that um, land really is part of the community and we just need to remember that and I'm so thankful to be part of the Iroquois Valley um, portfolio. Nicole, I know we went a little over, so sorry about that, but we're done. Not a problem. We're so, so appreciative of this presentation. We couldn't uh, couldn't do what we're trying to do and, and wouldn't be able to be here if it weren't for the support of Iroquois and, and other friends that have, have helped us get to where we are. And uh, you have to take sharing away from me because it seems like my screen has left. <laughs> So we'd, we'd love to address or have some conversation. Anyone has questions or comments to share? Awesome. Thank you guys so much. Um, let's see. I think I'm going to, we're going to just hop around a little bit. I'm going to go back to Cindy. And I've gotten a lot of questions for you, Cindy, about um this water harvesting that you spoke about in your presentation. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and um, share some sure. of those techniques with us? Yeah, I know we had a, I had a whole list of questions here, which is great. Thanks for all the questions. Yeah. So in, if you imagine like this desert ecosystem, right, you've got these um, arroyos are basically dry creeks. And what, what we do is we act like we're little beavers and instead of putting wood in those creeks, we fill them with rocks. And so what the rocks do is slow the water down as when it rains during the, the rainy season, it slows the water down and it allows it to infiltrate into the ground. And so that is the easiest way to harvest water in a desert ecosystem. And you start from the very top of the mountain uh, and then work down you know, to the bottom of the mountain. So that is the best way to harvest water on a ranch like the Diamond E, which is our ranch in Arizona. Um, another way is is building berms. So you can build like, imagine like a, kind of a modified stock dam, but it would be in a strategic location. And so that would actually hold water and allow it to infiltrate to the ground. And, and it's amazing because it doesn't take many rainy seasons, a couple of rainy seasons. Um, if, if you're looking at a big, deep arroyo, let's say like a six foot arroyo, if you manage to fill it with rock, 
um, it doesn't take too many rainy seasons to fill that arroyo up with soil. And then the vegetation, you know, because of the water that's that's trapped there, the, the vegetation comes back. It's pretty phenomenal. I took Rhea on a on a field trip when she came down to visit one time to this remarkable ranch that's been doing this uh, water harvesting technique for the last 30 years. And it's just one of the most stunning uh, grassland ranches in Arizona. Okay, so that's how we do the water harvesting. Um, there was some other water question too. What was the other one? Oh, okay, so there was a question there on how we seed the ground. Okay, so this is interesting because the native grass seed is, is already in the ground. So we don't actually buy seed. Um, in fact, we don't we don't buy seed at all. Um, what we do though is we harvest the water and then once we get the moisture back on the land, the grass, the native grasses come back up. So the seed is there, it's dormant. Um, I'm at least in Arizona and Mexico. Um, I'm I'm experimenting with that now in Missouri. I'm trying to convert our our farm there from this kind of fescue native grass farm into all native grasses. And I'll I'll see, you know, on that one if I'm gonna have to, I may have to feed hay that's got native um native grass seed in it is how I would do it in that particular setting. If I needed to put seed on the ground, that was that's how I would seed. Um okay any other questions Cindy, that you see? Yeah. Cindy, we have one here. Um, how many workers do you employ full-time, part-time? Can you oh, tell my. us a little bit about the labor market and yeah, um, sure. No, it, it just depends on on the business. Uh, our our packing, our processing facility, I have 10 full-time people and um I pay them really well. They're all really good. They're good artisan butchers. And um, we have really good retention. So I don't have any problems retaining help. Um, and people like to be in South Dakota. So it's actually, you know, kind of a, an easy thing. On the ranches, uh, we have uh, our partners down in Arizona, Stephen and Angie Terrell. And then Stephen hires employees as he needs them to build fence and to help with waters and that type of thing and cattle movement. And... Um, and in our other projects in South Dakota, we have about five employees that help with everything else with, you know, food deliveries, marketing, sales, all that kind of thing. So that's it for us, for employees. Awesome. Um, I have a, a couple of people coming back with questions about your water harvesting techniques. Oh, um, sure. I, so I'm going to wrap in a couple of questions into one. Um, okay. Somebody asked, how do you control the shrubs and bring back the native grasslands? So oh, okay. can you talk a bit more about those restoration practices for the native grassland? Sure. Yeah, there's two There's two different ways to, to deal with shrubs. Actually, there's three different ways. Um, one is you can just go and mechanically remove the shrubs you don't want. I mean, some of these shrubs are native and they should be there. So we don't want to go just remove all the shrubs because they do have their, you know, ecological benefit. But they they have been allowed to basically take over so you can mechanically go in and 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 rip the the shrubs out um a second alternative which a lot of people do which i don't do is you know people go and they aerial spray all these you know vast acres of land and it kills the shrubs but i don't do that because it kills everything else too and then the third is is using a combination of grazing intensive grazing and mechanical shrub removal and that's what we do so we start with getting you know the shrubs will mechanically remove the shrubs that we want out of the land and then we'll use our cattle to kind of um break up the soil and then we'll come back in as things start to come back we'll use goats or other you know small livestock to start dealing with any shrub encroachment that's coming in and so we basically just um, basically eat their shrubs as they come up until the native grasses get a chance to take over. And that's worked really well for us um, on, on these desert ranches, these desert grasslands. Beautiful. Um, yeah. And then there was another one. Oh, with, okay. So there was a question I saw about how does vegetation bring water back? 
Um, and the reason it's important is because when you have bare soil, I mean, you just have basically bare ground that's useless. Um, any vegetation on the land, you're, you're, you've got life above ground and life below ground. So you're, you're healing, you know, that piece of land by providing vegetation on the surface and roots on the, you know, below the surface. So microbes can live and do their job. Um, and the reason vegetation is important in a desert environment is because um, as, as the plant grows, it releases water vapor into the atmosphere. And that water vapor actually is what allows cloud formation and rain to fall. So if you have no bears, if you have totally bare soil, you're, you're kind of in this cycle, this vicious cycle of never having rain because you don't have any, any moisture above your land. Mm -hmm. And you can actually see in these desert landscapes, these big rain like bursts right over a, a, a ranch. It's got really great grass. And then over here, the, you know, the neighbor that has terrible, you know, terrible terrain, doesn't have any grass at all, that doesn't rain at all. And so that's, that's actually truly happens in desert ecosystems. Okay. Is there, was there any other ones? I, yes, I do have one question I'm going to direct first to you, Cindy, and then I'd love to hear from Anna and Doug afterwards. Um, a lot of people asking, have you had any success with neighbor farms and getting them to use regenerative operations? And um, yes, like what is your, how, how have your neighbors responded to your presence and your practices? I'll go first. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, for us, we raise really weird looking cows. We have, I mean, all of our cows have horns or, you know, Buffalo. So we already kind of attract attention. So the neighbors are always kind of noticing what's going on. Uh, but we've had really good success. It, it doesn't happen overnight though. I mean, they kind of, they kind of look at your cows and then they look at what you're doing. Like, why are you doing that? Like, why do you have all these animals on this one pasture instead of just like opening them up to your whole ranch? Mm -hmm. um, but then they see that you have grass and they don't. And, and that your cows are really fat and healthy and those aren't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's just, uh, you know, it's more, you, you start, you start doing the right thing on the land and, and people do notice. And we we haven't we're having a big event in June here on our ranch, and you guys are anybody's welcome to attend, and um, and it'll be one where we it's it's a Criollo meeting with the Hornada Experimental Range, which is a USDA facility I work with, New Mexico State, Texas A and M, Penn State, etc. But it's a big uh, showcase, and and all of our neighbors will be there, so it'll be pretty neat. Send me the invite, Cindy. I'll be there. Okay, cool. <laughs> well, let, me, um, let me let me address this one question about the rocks on the bottom it. of the arroyo. Okay, so so it's not really the rocks on the bottom of the arroyo. You basically make a dam. You make a you you fill up. You you make a dam. You start with big rocks on the bottom. You put another layer, and you you build these little check dams, and um, we call them trincheras or check dams. And that's what we do. that's what we do. We actually build the dams. They slow the water down. They don't stop it because it filtrates through the rocks, but it does slow the water down and it and it traps the sediment. So it's really also good not not necessarily just for water um, qua uh, quantity, but it's really good for water quality. It's really good mm -hmm. like in areas of of heavy um, wildfires. These check dams really help with you know water clarity during wildfires as well or after wildfires. Thanks for clarifying that, Cindy. Sure. Okay, I'm just now looking at the time. We have a few more minutes left, so I want to jump over to Anna and Doug and hear the same, um, the answer to the same question about your neighbors. Have you had success, um, you know, helping folks transition to regenerative organic? And what is um, the neighbor's response to your presence and practices? Well, the the first answer that comes to my mind is it really depends on the neighbor. And the second is there aren't many neighbors. So mm -hmm. um, it, it is remarkably sparse. And if you haven't been here, it's hard to understand that. But um, there are fewer humans on this landscape than there have ever been. So there's just no people. And the few that are here are, you know, they're pretty embedded in the system they're in. And the, uh, 
the, the neighbors that are thoughtful and that, that we, uh, we, we get along with well, just think they cannot imagine the amount of work we do. Uh, because, you know, they operated a, a larger scale, but it has to be simpler so that two people can manage 40,000 acres, for instance, uh, in a cropping system. Whereas, you know, we have five to seven people managing a quarter of that acreage in, in the cropping system, and they just can't imagine doing it that radically differently. Um the neighbors that we don't get along with well, and, and there are not that many, um, but a couple that just find what we do as, um, you know, they're threatened by it, put it that way. And mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, I, I don't think we have made much, much influence on those immediately surrounding us. Uh, I, I believe that that organic farming is something you have to first believe in, and then you find uh, a community and ways to do it. And that community is is often not close to you. Mm -hmm. uh, you. Find people that think alike, not that just live together. If that makes sense. It does. Thanks, Doug. Um, I think I'm going to ask. There's so many good questions, but I, I'm going to move on to. Can you guys share some challenges that you face? um farming in drier environments yeah i mean the the first challenge is very basic it's just getting plants to grow um and we have we have had two of the three driest years ever recorded in this ecosystem in the last the last three years so um, you know, we, we had a year 2022 where the entire year we got less than two and a half inches of precipitation. And, you know, a desert is 10 inches or less. So um, it, it's hard to fathom again if you haven't been here and seen it. And then um, the recovery year after that was four inches. And so we're, we're really, um, it, it's a whole new paradigm. Um, well, and to one of the questions in the chat, like, but I don't know that you can really follow long-term drought patterns now. This is this is something that is uh, something we haven't seen. The old timers here haven't seen. It's not just about drought. It's about variability and how you make a system that's resilient to that. And so some of the other challenges we've faced, not just what do you do in a year where you have 9% of your production and you don't actually harvest, <laughs> you don't, you harvest less than the seed was you planted, like that has ripple effects to the whole team, like the mental health of out there trying to swath stuff when there's not really stuff to swath, is it, that takes a toll. And then as an organic farmer, you're embedded in the system of USDA support that doesn't necessarily appreciate your diversity and your complexity. And that same support that exists for our neighbors on the other side with a monocrop in terms of crop insurance is not the same support that we receive. I. I think there's a a misconception, and you know, I'm I'm really excited to hear some of what Cindy was explaining about regenerating uh, your your ranch environment. But in in my experience, building soil is a decadal process at best, and anyone that tells you they're doing it sooner, I've found to be largely fraudulent. And mm -hmm. We have to do all the right things and then see that manifest over many, many years. And over time, we we can have an impact and, and move things in a positive direction in terms of organic matter and, and soil and resilience. But it, it, there's no magic answer. You know, you can do all the right things, but if, if it, if you receive two inches of rain, you're not going to grow crops there. And so that that's a reality that I think is is not misunderstood. The the magnitude of climate change, I believe, is is largely still not comprehended by the public. Well and it's water resilience. So it's not just drought where we are, there's other places that have too much water. So it's mm -hmm. really how you make a system that can survive through that or mm -hmm. be able to spring back faster than um, others. Beautiful. I have two more minutes and I'm going to squeeze two more questions in. So um, 
The first one is what steps are you taking in your operation to promote water use efficiency? Just a couple would be great. Um, two things that immediately come to mind, and we don't do anything for one purpose, but when I thought about that question, it's the lengthening and diversifying the crop rotation, and that is the, the best way we have to bring more diversity and, and to better mimic nature into our our annual cropping system and the integration of livestock. So we're we're moving towards more grazing and doing that not as a separate but but fully integrated into the cropping system. Beautiful. Thank now, you. For, on my side, on my side, I I run um a breed of cattle that's really adapted to really dry desert conditions so i, I run those in every location mm -hmm. so they're really drought tolerant plus you know we harvest water we trap water right great okay last question for both of you what is your favorite resource? It can be an article, book, documentary for investors that want to learn more about this topic and what you're the amazing work you're doing. No, I don't know. I don't. Well, I I would say <laughs> I would say there's not one book, but um, the drought monitor just familiarize yourself with some of those resources and for your particular area where you're sitting in or an area you're interested in. Um, there's so much good work going on out there to understand what the impacts are of too much water or too little water. So I'm I'm a little more philosophical. So I was going big picture and thinking about some of my mentors, Wendell Berry and Fred Kirshenman and their, you know, uh, wisdom on the larger ethic of of agriculture. Yeah, there's so many good resources out there right now. And, you know, we just have to keep this regenerative ag movement moving forward. And I think uh, if we get enough people working together and enough investors really focusing on uh, the importance of this in, in terms of our food system, it'd be awesome. Thank you, guys. Saw, Go ahead. I saw a question in the, the chat I, I wanted to address if we've got a minute. I, Go for it. Someone asked, and I'm going to paraphrase, but uh, if we could contrast the uh, organic versus regenerative practices, I hope I'm remembering and getting that right. Pros and mm -hmm. cons, regenerative and organic methods. Um, I, you know, regenerative is a term that's very mis, you know, misunderstood or everybody has a different definition. But to my understanding, there is nothing regenerative until you're at least organic. And then regenerative is a way to make organic even more and better. Um, I don't see them as different at all. Um, but in order to be resilient in the long term, we have to be first organic, i.e., you know, avoid harm, if you will, and then mm -hmm. build on that to become regenerative. Thank you, Doug. Thanks for tackling that good question. All right, this is a great segue. I'm going to pass it over to Lacey. Sounds good. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Cindy, Anna, and Doug. We appreciate. Um, and thank you, everyone, for attending today's webinar. We appreciate all of your support of our organic farmers and ranchers as we continue to grow our impact. We did want to highlight that we currently have a robust pipeline, greater than 25 million. So if you are interested in making a new investment or adding to your existing investment, please do not hesitate to reach out to any of us on the team. We are happy to help. As for today's webinar, as I mentioned, Nicole and I will post it on our website by next week. If you have any ideas for future webinars or questions that we just didn't have time to answer, please email us and we'll get back to you. Our next webinar will be in June, so stay tuned for future announcements about the speaker and the registration link. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us and have a super rest of your day. Bye, all. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thank you, Cindy, Anna, and Doug.